Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming today. Now, retail design and brand culture are, of course, no stranger to change. They've long been propelled and informed by social shifts, by technological innovation, um, and, of course, issues surrounding uh, sustainability. But it was really the pandemic that revealed just how quickly change can kind of descend upon us and reveal that there's really a big appetite for alternative scenarios, alternative ways of living. So in the wake of all this kind of huge change, um, but also mammoth possibilities, um, in the conversation today I'm going to have with David Johnson, um, we're going to talk about navigating this future in flux um, with integrity. Now, David, for anyone that doesn't know, is the founder and executive creative director of the B Corp uh, creative design studio, Accept and Proceed, and Today Studios, which is a relatively new sort of think tank, future scoping think tank, as well as the host of uh, their podcast, Endless Vital Activity. Now, David has worked with brands including Nike, Rafa, Google, NASA. So we should have a lot to dig into today. David, over to you for a moment. Thank you, Katie. Um, I just wanted to say what a pleasure it is to be here with you in this prestigious setting. I've been thinking a lot recently about how much uh, I admire what you do, your ability to be able to scan the horizon and really synthesize what you see and present it back to the world in order to, for us to really be able to pick the, the futures that we want. And I think that's crucial in this moment, which isn't just a time of uncertainty. In fact, it's a tipping point for humanity. I think what you do is um, very much needed. And so I'm very thankful for those of you who are carrying those spotlights on behalf of us all and uh, kind of pointing the way. I think that um, what's crucial about it for us as a design studio is it informs the early stages of our process, which is spotting opportunities and challenges. Um, I think it's really interesting that you talk about this idea of a tipping point for humanity. I think a lot of people would agree with that because of this crazy change we've just been through. Um, but I do feel that there's a tendency for a lot of designers to kind of react to change. They're almost sort of problem solving. I was with a brand yesterday that was saying our mission really is just to problem solve the problems that are in front of us rather than thinking about what's coming. So they're kind of thinking about what's coming down the track rather than thinking, could I actually change this track? What do you think, you know, in, in terms of that? How do we need to sort of change the game in that respect? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think design is often cited as problem solving. And boy, do we have a few problems to sort out at the moment, especially in retail. Mm. And I think I just want to spare a thought. I'm sure a lot of the audience will be in retail. And to say it's been a tough year, I think would be an understatement. I think that um, we, we've seen something that... Um, kind of historically evolved with cities and towns and informed the way that cities and towns were constructed, hit a massive bump in the road. And I saw firsthand uh, in cities like New York, so many stores and boutiques closing that mm. will never come back. Yeah. And those spaces, you know, it's a problem solving exercise to think about what we're going to do with those spaces. But I think that equally in this moment, it's, a, it's crucial that we really take a pause and we kind of think about I suppose when we're talking about the future of retail, we can't do that without first thinking about the future, right? And I think that reflecting over the last 24 months or so on the fact that so many of the systems that we live within don't serve us very well. In fact, they're self-destructive. Mm. And in fact, more than that, they're fundamentally flawed. Yeah. And I think that these pause moments are quite important for us to think about, you know, are we doing this right? How can we do things differently? There's an amazing quote um, by Kres Weslin, which I try and remind myself of as a designer, which is any designer that's not considering their impact um, of their work on the planet should be stripped of the title creative. Because if you are damaging our planet in any way, are you really a creator or are you a destroyer? Now that's powerful words, I know, and I must admit it's hard to apply that to every piece of work, but it's something that I think we increasingly need to remind ourselves of. Yeah. There's another... Um, uh, thing that was said recently that, that I think sums up the situation very well for me. It's um, a quote from Adrian Nyman, who's a good friend of mine. He's the CMO of Arrival, which is an electric vehicle company. Mm. And he said simply, the world we have is not the world that we want. Mm. Or more than that, it's not the world that we deserve. So I think in these moments, really what I've been doing is looking to the future, seeing great opportunity, asking myself, and I think we all should, what are the ancestors that we want to be? Because this is a blank mm. canvas. I really think this is story time. So what are the stories that we want to tell about the future? It's a lovely way to think about it, thinking about we, us as the ancestors. Um, you know, if we're thinking about the, the world that we 
want and the world that we actually deserve. Again, a really nice way to phrase it, really powerful, provocative way to phrase it. Um, we really have to think about the kind of nature of what role does retail play in the fabric of our towns and cities? Because, of course, this is something that's changed enormously as well with the pandemic. You've seen a really quite huge exodus of people moving out of cities, this idea of micropolitanism. Um, and, but, of course, in cities as well, you've got what you know, some people call the atomization of urban culture. So there's a kind of grassroots appreciation mm. of what's happening in these urban epicentres. So all of a sudden, you know, for retail, I feel like this means that that old formula of having these mega flagships in cities and then you're kind of the sort of poorer cousin, the kind of small town mentality, sort of more regional stores, that's going to be exploded to a certain extent. And it's going to mean people are really going to have to think, you know, if you're a big brand, you're really going to have to think about if your fans, your consumers, your audiences are kind of everywhere. Mm. How, what does that mean for retail? What should... Do we need flagships? What's the future of these stores? What yeah. do you think about that? Well, there's a couple of things to think about there. Yes, I think there has been a mass exodus just in London alone. So over the last 24 months, we've seen one million people leave the city, right? First in relation to Brexit, and then obviously through the pandemic, people choosing to live and work differently. And it does actually make you think at what point does the, the city itself become unviable? Mm. But for context, you know, over the last four decades, we've effectively seen all city living double. And I don't think that's a trend that's going to slow down yeah. or reverse in any way. So, so really, I think increasingly brands and organisations are going to have to um, really start operating in mega cities. And I think they'll have to do it through the lenses of convenience and also integrating nature. And also, even in our mega cities, imagine embracing and celebrating a slower pace of life. Mm. We as a design studio through the pandemic actually introduced a nine day fortnight. So every other Friday we take off to go and explore and inspire ourselves. And that's something once we kind of introduced it, we're never going to go back on that. Yeah. I think a big turning point for me was actually a project that we did with Nike. Um, their, their, their kind of pinnacle flagship store at the time was House of Innovation. And we worked on that brand and all the content for the stores in Shanghai, New York and Paris. In um, Shanghai, I was lucky enough to be there when the store opened in 2018. And I must admit, I was amazed by what I saw. As I walked into the ground floor of that store, there was a group of art students who were actually drawing the store as if it was mm. art. Now, I've seen art students do that in galleries in London, not far from here, many, many times, but never in a retail space. That space also received 30,000 visits th per day, which made it one of the major tourist destinations yeah. of the city. Now, this is really interesting. I think, as you say, the, the, even in that time since 2018, we've come to really think of the flagship as being a little outmoded. Yeah. And increasingly, I think purchases from um, flagships are actually seen as more of mementos of your experience, like a reminder of the experience rather than the reason for going there, which actually is really interesting when you start to think like that. Moving on to this idea of, yes, I think there has been people choosing to move to the countryside or, mm -hmm. or, or kind of live closer to nature and I think that's the reason for it. I think increasingly what we're going to see is nature becoming the ultimate luxury. Yeah. Now I think that there could be not an exodus by brands but a moving of brands out into the countryside as well and I think that presents massive opportunity and it's quite exciting. Mm. So imagine if we're going to embrace nature as brands, could we have a retail forest? Could we have a retail mountain? Like what would a retail sunset <laughs> okay. feel like? So, um, Entirely with you, I think, on talking about, I mean, I've seen some incredible statistics actually also about even by as close as 2035 that nature will become the ultimate luxury. Mm. And the idea of having a sort of slower pace of life and, um, you know, people have called it the, anthrop the big anthropause that we've had in the pandemic. But just to kind of dial it back a bit with my sort of more cynical journalist brain on... <laughs> A retail sunset or a retail mountain? I mean, you know, isn't that notion, bearing in mind we're talking today about integrity in the retail landscape, isn't that kind of a sort of a bridge of co-opting and commercialising something too far? You know, isn't that the antithesis of a shift to being more responsible in a way? Or am I misunderstanding that? Um, but personally, I don't see it as co-opting. I see it as celebrating and actually protecting nature in many ways. But I think this point does deserve uh, more explanation. I think, I think the first point I'd like to make in relation to it actually is that at a certain point we need to admit that we've reached peak stuff. So for example, I've got a wardrobe full of clothes that if I treat right, I think will last me for the rest of my life and I do mm -hmm. hope I li live to a ripe old age. But would I support an organization that sells clothes that's also protecting the environment on my behalf, like Patagonia? 
Yes, I would. If Patagonia did a, a forest bathing activity, would I sign up for that 100%? If Patagonia mm. did a sunset experience, would I sign up? Of course, I'd support them. Interesting fact here, actually. Uh, just the other day, our creative director, Matt, told me that, did you know that rainbows aren't actually arcs, they're circles? We mm. just see them as arcs because of yeah. our perspective. Now, a brand that can show me that rainbows are circles, yeah. I want to get behind. And I think that really the challenge of our time is reconnecting with nature. So, no, I think that, I mean, we as an agency have played with this idea of light and dark and kind of drawing attention to um, sunrises and sunsets through our light calendar uh, series, which was a, a project we explored for 10 years. But usually, historically, it's been the domain of artists. If you think of Olafa Eliasson and his work in the Turbine Hall with the Weather Project, mm. that was a transformative experience for anyone that went through it, I believe. But all he mm. was doing was referencing something that's accessible to us all. The yeah. sun rises and sets every day, but it usually takes an artist to draw your attention to yeah. that. I think increasingly it should be the domain of brands to actually be able to kind of ring fence that and, and protect it. I think one brand that springs to mind that is doing this quite authentically is Heckles, who mm. is obviously, as you probably know, Margate's answer to Aesop. And recently, I think recognizing that there's a lot of interdependencies in flux and also that there's this kind of almost turmoil between global and local, um, before uh, actually starting to think about actually distributing their product in Asia, they decided to set up production there rather than ship their product over, which I think is admirable. And that's all around this idea of shortening supply chains, but also connecting your organization and your, your audience, I suppose, to local environments. They've also just released plans uh, to take over a derelict casino in Margate, which is their, their hometown, obviously. And it looks amazing. They've got um, kind of product uh, experiences you can go through. They've got beekeeping. They've got a whole beauty academy. All of this is designed to bring you closer to their process mm. as a community. But still, for the most part, what I'm seeing is community on brand terms. And what excites me more is what happens if you build the framework and the systems and then hand over the reins to the community. What happens then? Absolutely. And just to track back very quickly to the biophilic um, aspect, as in putting nature in the store, really, it was just making me think about a few examples already, actually, of brands that are doing that really successfully. I mean, even Hermes thinking about, you know, rather than just having more square footage for product, basically it was the most beautiful garden in their, their revamped London flagship. And then you've got Glossier, who, of course, is this actually mostly well-known for being a really successful online brand. But actually, if you look at their store spaces, it's the store spaces that are starting to kind of generate... Um, you know, a lot, a lot more custom, a lot more of sort of consumer loyalty. Um, and they've got, they've got this kind of incredible store that was a pop-up in Seattle that had all this Mexican moss and grass in it. And they've just relaunched that as a full-time store because apparently their, their local customers said, this is the thing that actually makes us feel like we're connected to the community because we sort yeah. of see ourselves in it via the nature itself. So just to sort of, it was just making me think of those examples. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I want to go. <laughs> but with the Heckles thing, I think, again, it is a very interesting brand to look at because you're right, it is um, a really interesting kind of, a, a small brand that's really starting to boom. And what you're talking, I mean, we don't necessarily talk about the prices. I do have a bag, uh, someone gave me a sort of £25 bag of seaweed that's in my cupboard at the moment. If we just put that to the side for Good the moment. Yep. The London store is fantastic, the East London store, because they have, as you say, they even have a lab, a growing lab in there mm. that they're generating the spirulina for the snacks that people have when they're in there. So they are thinking kind of macro vision on a micro scale, which mm. I think is interesting. Um, but in terms of what that means for the big picture thinking, I feel like this is really about regeneration, what you're talking about. It's not just saying reflect the local neighbourhood. It's actually let's regenerate and recreate. You know, it's, it, it's stylist. We've called it before the idea of a sort of hometown hero in a way. If you're, you know, you mentioned this idea of co-ownership. How far can that go, do you think? Do you think there should actually be moving forward with the brand space and the services? Should there literally be a sense of a kind of co-opting situation, cooperative, sorry, situation? Yes, I, I really think, well, I think it's happening and I think it's necessary. What we see a lot with our partnerships and projects is, is brands and their communities essentially out of sync. You know, you see yeah. that the brand is either a little bit too early or a little bit too late. And that's always going to be ca the case because there is still this kind of divide for the most part. 
I think that um, a project that springs to mind that I did want to share, which is I'm particularly proud of, is a project we've just done with Nike. It's in Belgrade in Serbia, of all places. Mm. And it's actually been to design and renovate a basketball court and play area mm. um, within a, a community space there. But crucially, it was actually built from 20,000 upcycled, locally sourced wow. trainers. Yeah. And what's really exciting about that space for us is it brings together three things that we're very passionate about, which is community, uh, play, and also planting seeds for the future and what's what's I think the fun of a project like that is it's now over to the community mm -hmm. so will it bring more joy to the community will it address any any social issues we'll wait and see I mean it's over to them but I think what's what's crucial about these types of initiatives is that you create a platform that can at least attempt to unleash some of the the local talent I yeah. suppose that could have laid dormant otherwise and where I get really excited is not just thinking about, you know, brands turning up in retail spaces in communities and then kind of bouncing out when they don't need to, to sell product anymore. Actually, a much longer term commitment to that community. Yeah. So they're there for the, for the long haul, I suppose. What would happen if brands really did that, essentially creating, you know, fully integrated community centers 2.0? I think what we'd start to see is really the, the, the kind of development of future artists and musicians and even politicians. Mm. And also we'd see those brands themselves transformed unimaginably, like directly by the audience that they're truly there to serve. Yeah. Which, I mean, if, if that were to happen, um, do you think, because, you know, over the last year, I think we've seen quite a few brands in a way called out for kind of virtue signaling. Mm. People sort of almost sort of sometimes inadvertently sort of bandwagoning on the fact that there's been, a, we've been in crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, people are very savvy to sort of brand bullshit in yeah. a way. You know, as you say, if you're gonna be there for community, you really have to show up for the community. Do you think, David, that that will mean that there's gonna be a need for a sort of radical, sense of radical transparency in the way brands operate and particularly the spaces they have? Yeah. I think radical transparency is part of it. I think that we're talking today about integrity in retail, and I think that for the most part, this out of syncness that happens between brands and the community is, is actually down to a kind of lack of authentic integrity on the brand's part, if I'm completely mm -hmm. honest. And I think we need to address that. I think we need to understand that brands are really the trustees of the audiences that they serve, and they need to operate and kind of own the businesses in a way that truly reflects and supports that. Mm. I think that increasingly um, we're kind of seeing around radical transparency really interesting developments in things like accounting, for example. I don't know if you've heard of shadow accounting, but we've come to realize that there is no such thing as a single object. It's, it's the kind of integrated parts of all of the different uh, processes and ingredients that have got it there. And what shadow accounting does is effectively account for the shadow that's cast by your operations or your product. Right, okay. What's interesting about that is, um, What's crucial is, is that we don't just start kind of being fully transparent about the way we account. Actually, we need to put carbon on our balance sheets. Mm -hmm. And things like carbon, we know that if you do it as a one-for-one, one, like the carbon that we're putting up into the atmosphere right now has got a one-for-one one amount. But we know over time, because we can't get it down, there's a cascading effect to the way that it's actually going to affect yeah. our planet. Yeah. Effectively, we are killing people in the future through our operations right now which I know is a heavy thought, but it's very true. So yeah. really shadow accounting in combination with the future projections of your operations is going to be crucial. And I think that what I'm seeing, which is quite heartening, is you know a lot of people adopting this. But if you were to apply it to the NASDAQ right now, for example, 78% of businesses would go out of business overnight because they're not truly accounting for the true cost of their product. Yeah. You mentioned that Heckles is expensive. It's expensive for a reason. Mm. You know, they're being radically transparent about all of their operations. And it is heartening. I think that we're seeing big moves forward um, to embrace radical transparency, not just across accounting or, mm. or in, in retail, but every brand touch point. Which ultimately means we're gonna, I guess, it's about brands having to think rather than the quick fix. You're always going to have to think about the long haul impact, which is really what brands should probably have been doing all along. Absolutely. Um, I mean, shadow accounting in itself is kind of, it's, it's a brilliant concept. It's terrifying. Um, and actually, I think it's probably something for a talk all of its own, yeah. um, which, is, which is why I'd like to just shift tack a little, because there is something I wanted to, to hear your thoughts on. Mm. Um, because again, we've seen this sort of paradigm shift um, during the pandemic. Um, towards a very different way of living and working and behaving, you know, more nomadic behaviours, people travelling a lot, realising they don't have to be tethered to their, their, you know, their localities they were before, new breeds of career emerging even, you know, people finding that they can have an entire career 
via social media. I guess what I'm saying is it's very mutable, very changed. Should, you know, should the physical landscape be thinking in terms of somewhere that's much more like a kind of R&D space? And I don't mean like a lab, I mean more, um, you know, still with the kind of the theatrics and the, the, the retail has always done when it's been doing it at its best. Do you think there is that sense that it should be a much more kind of a beta space, if yeah. you like? I think that's a really good way to put it. There's a really interesting uh, quote from Paola Antonelli. I actually interviewed her for our, our podcast series, Endless Vital Activity. And she's got a really interesting take on the fact that art galleries are effectively the research and development of society. Mm. Are they? Well, of course they are. And in fact, so is a design studio. So through our work, what we do, like we ran an art gallery ourselves actually for five years. And it was really interesting. Some of the and, work... And, and of course, you talked about Nike, people going in there and treating it like a museum to an extent, the Shanghai store. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and I think that you kind of realise that, um, you know, there was a project we put on in our gallery that was actually a kinetic sculpture which played out meteor strikes to the moon mm. over a 10-year period. Very nerdy, very beautiful, this big floating <laughs> metal space blanket. Nothing, <laughs> or, nothing at all. We're very nerdy at Accept and Proceed. And I think that um, what was fascinating about that was... Uh, it caught the attention of NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab. Mm. And we've been in partnership with them because of that project that was self-initiated for the last three years. You don't really win NASA as a client. You know, you can imagine mm. how many people are knocking okay. on the door. But it was about authenticity and integrity in the work that we were producing that actually had a kind of gravitational pull. And I'd love to encourage more organisations to listen to their instinct in that respect. And I think that when you think about either an art gallery being a research and development of society or a design studio being a research and development of all of the work it undertakes, retail itself, of course, is its own research and development at mm. every point. And I think that probably retail spaces shouldn't be fitted out for a three or five year period. They should be kind of considered in a way that can be iterated upon itself yeah. so that they're constantly evolving. I think they have to really accommodate that state of flux, which is, is always the case with retail. Yeah. Um, I feel, um, you know, that talking about NASA has just made me think another thing we really should talk about actually should be technology. Mm. Of course, thinking we haven't really got onto that yet. Um, you know, there's a vast array of ways to use technology in the retail space now. Again, since the pandemic, really pragmatic ways. The idea that, you know, you can go into a space, you can use an app to control the space, to look at things, to, you know, not even speak to somebody if that's what you want. Um, but also really exhilarating kind of immersive uses of technology. And as 5G enters the fray, coming very soon, we're going to see that kind of, you know, almost sort of cinematic excitement and experiences, things that were just in virtual spaces online, being able to actually do those things in a really organic, exciting way mm. in, a, in a retail space, making it more like a theatrical space. Um, but in terms of, you know, some of those things, how, how do you think, with your experience, the kind of massive brands you've worked with, is the best way to use technology to create an experience where it fosters a sense of connection? And I, by that, I mean either with the, the consumer or the fan, let's say, and the brand, or with the fans themselves, a group of fans in the store. What you mean? You, you know, you've done a lot of work where you've integrated tech. So what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, I think the digital and, and physical worlds are converging. There's no doubt. And in fact, for for most people, living without technology is utterly unthinkable. Yeah. I was thinking about this the other day. We, I was watching telly with my my wife, and we were watching a program about a retreat where celebrities and rich people effectively were going to this wellness retreat, and they were having their mobile phones taken off them as they mm. entered. And I was almost as shocked as they were. You know, I was thinking, is this legal? Like, what would happen to me if someone took my mobile mm. phone and something happened to my, my child and I couldn't get in touch with them? But of course, it would be fine. You know, I was OK mm. in the old days. And I think what's interesting, <laughs> when I really <laughs> thought about, um, like, explored that, that thought further, you know, the, the very devices that I think connect me closer to the people that mm. I love, how, how well does that really serve us? Yeah. You know, how often does it actually interu interrupt your life or interrupt your exchange with the people that you love rather than actually enhancing the experience? With that in mind, um, I wanted to mention an amazing project that we were able to undertake um, for House of Innovation Paris, actually, called Mission Control, which is a series of 15, it's a bank, effectively, of 15 screens, and it feeds in um, local communities, Nike Training Club data and Nike Run Club data, um, and it also integrates, integrates it with local weather APIs as well as pollution monitors. Mm. So what that means is you can go in and you can actually be presented with the safest running routes in relation to local air quality or pollution levels or weather systems. Yeah. Um, and I think what's really interesting about that 
that is over time it would then start to recognize you individually as a visitor and then you really are creating an integrated piece of technology that isn't there to distract you or make you necessarily kind of want to buy more or shop it's actually actively serving you and creating more of a flow state and supporting mm. your life rather than distracting oh 100 percent. i mean i absolutely agree that there are many instances in which tech can be very meaningful um, in all kinds of ways, it can personalise our experience. It can kind of create a world which we respond to better. There's all, you know, sentient spaces, all kinds of things. But I do wonder if there's also, because obviously retail spaces don't have to be one thing or the other. There's room for lots of types. Um, do you think, you know, we are in a world where people are sort of obsessed with self-optimization, mm. with monitoring themselves, whether mm. it's for food and dietary things, fitness trackers, um, even fashion. You know, we've got some brilliant digital wardrobing apps now that allow you to see what's in your wardrobe so you don't just keep buying the same things. Yeah. Really, really useful things. But is there this idea, that because I do kind of wonder, you know, retail um, in, in some ways has been brilliant for that kind of escapist, transformative experience. I mean, actually, when you were talking about um, the, the programme you were watching, it made me think of Adidas a couple of years ago at Coachella, did this incredible experience called um, Wish You Were Here, where what happened was you basically, had, it, was, it was for Gen Z, pretty much, put their phones in, into a locker, only got them out at the end. And it was that sense of, and it was like a sort of watching a music gig and things like that. Yeah. And Gen Z really responded to it because actually having that kind of sense of anonymity and being unleashed from yeah. this other world, because that other world of data is so prevalent now, they loved it. So I was just wondering, is there a, is there a space for you where, you know, do you think almost a sense of sort of mind, mindless mindfulness yeah. that retail could provide that as well? And again, 100%. I'm not saying the tech isn't important, but... No, I think the tech can be part of that. I think what we're seeing is, is real diversity in demographics. In fact, we're seeing fluid demographics. Mm. And I think that we should celebrate the niche and we should celebrate diversity. And that really, I, I think that what you're going to see is retail spaces effectively mimicking the fluid demographics that they've got. Mm. So you've, you've got this really exciting idea, I think, that everything's going to get a bit gloopy over the coming years. I love that phrase. Yeah, it's going to get a little bit, a little bit strange <laughs> to reflect the audiences that they are there to serve. I think that you're right, you know, why do we shop? Why do we go clubbing? It's, it's in part, it's kind of hedonism, it's escapism. Mm. And I think that retail spaces still have to provide that, even if they're not going to be temples of consumption in the future. Yeah. So I love this idea that spaces can kind of be what you need when you need it. Mm. We had an incredible experience a few years ago with a project that was self-initiated actually called Explorations in Running. And it saw our team running across the globe on five different continents in some of the most extreme weather conditions we could find. Mm. And we tracked huge amounts of data from that experience, which was, um, you know, the kind of the weather, the emotional state, the elevation, all of this data provided us the opportunity to create um, a kind of content that would affect your mood, I suppose, and maybe enhance your performance mm -hmm. while running. It taught us a huge amount, but actually it was interesting because with all the data, you kind of lose the, the human footprints in it sometimes. Yeah. And it was the serendipity moments of that particular project that were surprising. I think as we get spaces integrated with technology that really provide a two-way conversation with the, the people who are using it, I think it gets really, really interesting because the space can effectively um, kind of create that mindful release that, yeah. that, that is unexpected and surprising you know, through those experiences. Absolutely. Um, I think it's really interesting sort of thinking about how data can be used in this idea of intelligence and being out there, almost a kind of idea of open sourcing, mm. which brings me to the idea of, you know, um, sort of activism in a way, which is something else. I mean, obviously we have talked about activism quite a bit um, in this discussion already, but I wanted to come back to it because again, I feel like it's one of those things where um, we've really seen during the pandemic that brands, you know, there's been a bit of a shift to brands understanding that actually, as opposed to say the 80s and 90s, where it was all about the brand bravado and sort of brand domination, there needs to be that sense of brands venerating their fans maybe above themselves in a way. Um, purpose, you know, how do you, in the truest sense of the word, because again, I think it's something people have become maybe slightly anaesthetized in some ways. How do you think that should best be manifested in the physical retail space in the future? It's a really interesting question and an important one we've been learning about over the last few years. So an interesting thing happened with our studio a couple of years ago when Extinction Rebellion started doing their kind of social uprising mm. and protests. Myself and my business partner, Matt, were really interested in the brand actually, but we actually really loved the movement, the community that was building up there and obviously loved the fact that they were elevating the conversation around climate change. So we offered the whole studio the day off to come and join us protest. But in fact, you quite quickly realized that not 
everybody likes Extinction Rebellion because right. they're, they're, you know, they're, their kind of activities are quite divisive. Yeah. And we realised just in our studio that, in fact, some people didn't want to support them. But if you're going to allow activism to be part of your organisation, it has to be on the individual's terms. It can't be a top-down approach. Yeah. So what we've introduced in our studio is time off for anything that you want to protest about or anything that you want to support. And not only that, we're actually using, you know, you can basically use the skills and the platform of the studio to support those initiatives. Mm. This is a completely democratised um, approach to the way that we as a studio can kind of engage with activism, which I think is crucial for raising to, uh, in our awareness certain issues that we need to address. However, will it get us to where we need to get ultimately? I'm not sure. It's very divisive, as I say. Mm. I think that really these kind of open conversations have to be meaningfully introduced. And I think what we're seeing with brands is certainly them engaging in some of these bigger social discussions. Now, an interesting case study was actually Patagonia's Action Works Cafe, which was on London Fields last year, and it was effectively a, a kind of a cafe that could also provide training for activism. And I found this um, situation when going there that it was very true to and authentic to Patagonia, um, and I celebrated that. But it did make me think, does retail have a, have a role to play in activism? Mm. Actually, no, I don't think it does. I think that retail could be seen as the human face of a brand. And I think that what retail has to increasingly do is create a safe space for the communities that they serve to have the conversations yeah. that they need to. Yeah, very interesting, quite contentious in a way, actually. Um, so more perhaps, so you're, you're saying maybe, rather than saying you're an activist brand, it's being an advocate in a way, an advocate for the community that, you're, that you serve. Yeah, yeah, facilitating and, and, yeah. and supporting the conversations that need to be had authentically by your community. Yeah. Um, I think we're probably about to get pushed off the stage quite soon. Okay. So just to wrap up, um, I've just been sort of furiously making some notes myself. Um, some things that I've taken away from our, our chat. Um, if you aren't designing for the planet, are you even a designer at all? Nature is going to be the ultimate luxury, uh, potentially uh, raising the game for biophilic design. It's time to consider a new era of cooperatives. Retail is already R&D and brands should really use that to tap into dormant creativity. We're looking forward to potentially devolved brandscapes. Mindless mindfulness could become maybe a sector in its own right. Um, and finally, that radical is perhaps the only route we have to true regeneration. Um, David, would you like to Thank finish? you. Nicely put. I think that, um, yeah, just in closing, I wanted to say a couple of things. I think that um, I must admit just a few years ago, I was feeling very pessimistic and overwhelmed by all of the challenges of our time. Um, I don't really feel like that anymore. I think I made a conscious decision to really use all the tools at my disposal, which is mainly my partnerships, the businesses that we, that we run collectively. And obviously every project is an opportunity to really open these conversations. I think it's been a real privilege to be here with you today and talk about the future of retail. And I think it's a real privilege for all of the audience to be working for the brands that they do and own the retail spaces that they do. And I think with that privilege, it becomes a responsibility. I think in this moment, as I say, those words I'd like to ring in people's minds is that the world we have is not the world that we want, and it's not the world that we deserve. But as designers and brands, we actually can create the future that we do want. Mm. So I really would um, like to raise a rallying cry for everyone to be as visionary and radical as they can with their brands and their spaces. And let's build the future that we do want. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>